Today, our landscape class is visiting Hartwell Tavern uh, in Concord, Massachusetts. It's a historic site, and a, uh, there's actors that walk about the property on the weekends, uh, showing you what life was like back in the colonial days. <clears throat> you can see in this picture we have a, a woman in the doorway with the wide-brimmed hat and the dress of the day looking out and, and I'm going to use her in my painting as well as the building. This is a small sketch uh, done with three values basically and what I'm trying to do in this sketch is organize my idea for the setting with figures and of importance is this big shadow that goes from the right tree to the ground and then back up the building. This is the big shape in this painting and I'm trying to keep the value of this shape similar throughout and uh, use it to hold the painting together. Hopefully in this sketch you see it. I'm starting the painting uh, with yellow ochre and a brush. I'm not doing any drawing beforehand. I'm finding recently um, that I enjoy this method of working with the brush from the beginning. It's not that I, so much that I mind to see the pencil and the finished work or that I I dislike a drawing in the beginning. I just find that I can express forms and angles uh, with in some cases more accuracy but in most cases definitely a, a greater sense of expression and uh, volume. Um, I do start light as in this case most of the um, the colors that I'm going to use are of a warm nature and the building has a warm nature, the ground, the light in the back so using yellow ochre is going to support that and you can see I've already started on creating the the idea of this shape even though it's not necessarily painting the, the shadows directly you can see a connection between the tree on the right, the stones in the foreground and lower part of the painting, as well as the building up to the left, left and upwards. A uh, few placements of figures just to kind of warm up. If I decide midway that I want a different pose, it's not that hard to change uh, working in such a light fashion. After laying in that color, uh, it dries pretty quickly, I go to the background. The background, it, it, the brush continues to amaze me, the, the rapid way that I can, I can c get that background foliage in place and with a, a great deal of expression um, using the brush on dry paper and once it's uh, set uh, in place, I go back and augment it with uh, some darks or, or this or that. I approach the front green in much the same way, except that I'm adding a bit more yellow to the green. I want it to have a stronger feel of sunlight than the distance. The distance purposely is left kind of pale and gray because you remember this is a, a backdrop to my figures and if it's too bright, loud, or contains too much contrast, it's not going to allow me to really see those figures. So if you compare that background to the photograph, you'll see a huge difference. Now into the um, the, the final touches of some shadows. Uh, the strokes become very important. You can There's already a feeling of strong strokes in the foreground and the background and now we move, I'm going to move right to the to the heart of the matter with uh, the strong dark, uh, the shadow that's going to be running throughout the scene. I'm going to start with the tree on the left here and I'm very much thinking like a calligrapher. Can you see how I'm, I'm using uh, single brush strokes, not going back in to refine much of it and uh, counting on my sense of the, the gesture of the tree and uh, trying to make a little sense of the light that's falling on the tree. I do start with the trunk and the branches and later bring in foliage. 
uh, right into a deep warm tone through through the fence. This is a shadow that's falling on the stone fence. So I'm leaving parts of it untouched. Other parts uh, carry this big shadow. I'm placing uh, mostly burnt sienna, but as the paint is still wet, I introduce uh, some ultramarine blue. As this dries, the blue comes out a little more. And notice how it's connected from top to the right and now to the bottom. Uh, my next goal is to carry some shadows across the, the green field, the green lawn as it were, uh, cast from the tree and up the side of the building. Again, trying to say this with as few strokes as possible. I'm really being economical across the, the grass area. And I've just gone in going haywire now with this dark. Uh, a lot of burnt sienna, a little bit of neutral tint. And then while it starts to set, while this color starts to set, it's not fully dry, I introduce ultramarine blue right on the paper and mix it on the paper. I'm thinking of a pattern as I place the dappled shadows on the rooftop. They have a, an angularity and they reveal some uh, of that dappled light that we're picking up. And I approach the, the shadows on the building the same way. There are a lot of uh, diagonals to these shadows and I'm trying to make use of the, the brush to create that. So again uh, some burnt sienna followed by neutral tint and ultramarine blue is what I'm using to create almost all these shadows. Perhaps a bit bluer in the building, a bit warmer in the stones and in the tree. Tonally though they're very closely matched, all these darks. And it's a little unusual to work, uh, to go right to the darks. There is a um, Ted Kowski, who was a regional painter some years ago, he really introduced watercolor to New England, at least northern New England, um, taught his students this way. He would often begin with uh, the mid-tone or the darks, later adding lights. So we're placing uh, similar tones into the foliage, uh, reserving some lights for a feeling of light hitting the side of the tree. I want the light to have a consistent direction, so I'm using some highlights on the right side. There's our figures, uh, painted dark as silhouettes, and um, they have a nice position uh, against the light foliage. The light foliage now, I'm, I'm adding just a faint shadow back there. We need to break it up a little bit, and I want to create a, a fence uh, running behind them. So again, I'm concentrating on the light areas and painting a sort of light mid-tone through the back area. A little bit of fencing with a finer brush. And these, these darks are relative to the subject. In other words, I'm painting a fence or a stone or a building. But at the same time, I'm thinking to connect the darks in any way that I can. Sometimes I have to invent a method, and that fence was was there, but I was conscious that I was also connecting a dark passage. Looking at the windows now, I've switched to a smaller brush. I'm trying to keep the same sort of lively brushwork. I'm trying to not uh, become overly concerned with the details, but express them as generally and as freely as I can. But they are small elements, so I, I have to slow down a bit and and um, concentrate on, on small areas with that small brush. What do these darks do? If you're wondering, you know, dark on dark, how's it even going to be visible? Well, they, they create transparency to those shadows. As the painting dries further, you'll see that. I've introduced a little bit of a blue-gray wash to the rooftop because I want to concentrate the sunlight in the lower part of the building and across the stones uh, to highlight the figures and and uh, so I'm diminishing some areas such as the rooftop there. Well it's uh, now I'm going to create the stones into this 
uh, area of shadow that we, we started with. Look at how it's dried. That ultramarine blue has a, a really nice glow to it in the foreground, and you can see it up in the left-hand side of the building. Um, but it's dried now, so I can work into this area with some bold darks to uh, give us an idea how the stones are put together and the sort of enjoyable pattern that they create in the foreground. Sometimes the, the painting suggests this to me. And I seldom these days look at my reference, but rather look at my painting. And my painting usually gives me uh, an idea of where the stones or fencing or sometimes branches and foliage should go. Some adjustments to the right side, um, all with the idea of creating a, an effect of light moving over the scene. And it's time for a little bit of color work. I'm going to introduce a bright red. The guy who was uh, on hand that day was interested in a red coat. And so I want to give a little reference to that. Also having a, a bright color in all of these darks and midtones is an effective way to uh, gain the attention of your audience. So we'll use that in small amounts in the clothing of our subject and in the face. Oh, here you can see now I'm introducing some local color. This was a, a, a brownish building, and I want to give a little reference to that. And so I'm just, the shadows have dried, and I'm rubbing in a bit of yellow ochre and raw sienna. And what this does also is it sets off the whites, the remaining whites that are in the painting. Uh, for example, the, some of the mullions in the building, some of the tops of the stones, some of the uh, hat of our subject in the doorway. It's being set off by darks behind her and by adjusting some of the light areas in the building, I can gain more interest in the whites that are left. So what I'm doing now is, again, working on smaller details, edges, small passages of light through the tree, adjusting to what's there. The painting has, at this stage, a finished quality, and anything that I add is going to kind of respect the work that was done beforehand, and I won't, I won't be adding uh, any broad passages, but mostly texture and edging and uh, highlights at this point. So I'm adding actually some clabbered now, skinny brush. Uh, it looks great when it moves through the shadows. What it we keep placing the, the, the clabbered and the, the mullions and little details. Now I, I felt there was a weakness to this left-handed corner uh, so I put in some more cast shadows, and um, it settles that left-hand corner. In retrospect, after finishing this painting, I realized, you know, maybe I should have left it yellow ochre and counted on my signature to kind of compensate for that area, but you live and you learn. So maybe the next time I have a similar scenario, I'm going to remember, hey, leave that unfinished corner and you can tie it together with your signature when you when you sign the painting. Anyway, look at it. It's got a pretty finished quality to it. There's not much more to do here. Just some accents and some little blending of colors. The light is really streaming through the scene. Beautiful in the back and uh, quite handsome on the side of the building. Uh, nice highlights on the stones and long shadows across the lawn. Um, I'm going to sign the painting now. I'm going to use a bit of that red. Uh, when I sign it, I try to be a little flashy. I don't want to be too humble. I want people to say, well, this guy's pretty courageous to put a bright red signature there. It looks good most of the time. Here's the finished painting. Um, I'm very pleased with the way the darks run through the painting. Uh, upper right to the bottom center and then back up the left hand side. I feel it creates a real strong sense of unity. If 
you remember, that's one of the first things we did, and then we tied it together with, um, with some lighter colors, some uh, bright colors on our figures, and some strong darks in the windows and around our, our uh, Madame of the Hartwell Tavern. So I, I was, I'm pleased that I captured the light and was able to show you how a big shape can unify your painting.